Okay, so welcome back everyone for the two last uh, talks of this afternoon session. It is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Laurent Debilet from uh, l'Université de Paris, uh, EMJPRG. And uh, Laurent will talk about uh, an almost optimal functional inequality for the Landau equation of plasma physics. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for the invitation. I'm really sorry I was not able to join you uh, in Switzerland this time, but I definitely hope that in, uh, in the near future we will be able to travel again uh, as we should. So uh, today I would like to speak about the Lando operator and the Lando equation of plasma physics. So let me begin by um, introducing the operator. So uh, let's suppose that you have a density uh, F of V of uh, charged particles, so typically electrons. And uh, V here is the velocity of the, of the particles. So uh, you will write down an operator which will act on F as a function of V. And this operator will describe the effect of the binary collisions between the charged particles. So uh, this was first done by Lando in the 30s and uh, uh, most probably was very well aware of the, of the works of Boltzmann in the, in the 19th century for uh, rarefied neutral gases. And his idea was that uh, when particles are charged, then they are interacting through the Coulomb potential. And somehow the Boltzmann collision operator uh, cannot be used anymore. And one needs to write down a new operator, which is not a zero order operator in terms of derivative, but now a second order operator. And uh, the operator that you proposed is, uh, is written down on the slide. So you take the divergence of uh, the integral with respect to all uh, possible uh, incoming uh, velocities W. And uh, Inside, you will put a quadratic term, which represents the binary interactions, in which you have this f of w gradient f of v, and you have an extra term, which is minus f of v gradient f of w. The first term is a, a second order because you have the divergence in front of the integral. And the second term is actually first order because the gradient is acting on W, which is an integration variable. So you have, in some sense, when you write it this way, you have a second order part and a first order part in terms of derivatives inside the, inside the operator. And uh, as you can see, this is a quadratic second order in derivatives, non-local operator. In order to describe it completely, one needs to explain what is this A of V minus W. So actually this A is a matrix and it is a matrix which is made in the following way. You, you multiply a scalar, which is called Psi, by the matrix Pi, which is just the matrix of the orthogonal projection onto the orthogonal set of the quantity which is called z here and which is the argument of pi. So pi basically projects you onto the orthogonal set of z. And now you multiply this by the scalar which is psi of the modulus of z. And here z will be the relative velocity v minus w. Now, uh, the, the, the point is that up to a constant, uh, psi, in the case of the Coulomb interaction, is exactly 1 over z. So here, a of v minus w is just the modulus of v minus w to the minus 1 times the projection onto v minus w orthogonal. And this gives you the, uh, the definition of Landau's operator for Coulomb potential. So this was obtained in the 30s. And uh, 
it's customary from, for mathematical purposes to sort of extend this definition in the case when the function psi, which is the scalar, which is in front of the projection operator, is not z to the minus one, but is some other power. And for reasons that I will um, explain a little in the, in the sequel, there is this following uh, vocabulary. We say that when z is like, uh, when psi, sorry, is like z to the gamma plus two with gamma between zero and one, then we speak of hard potentials. When psi is exactly z to the, when psi is exactly z to the square, we say that we are in the case of Maxwell molecules. When psi is like z to the gamma plus two with gamma between minus two and zero, we speak of moderately soft potentials. And finally, when psi is like z to the gamma plus two with gamma between minus four and minus two, then we speak of very soft potentials. And of course, the important point is that the physical case, which is a Coulomb case, corresponds to gamma equal to minus three. And so it belongs to the very soft potentials. And as you can see, it's not even at the border of moderately soft potentials, but it's really in the middle of the range of the so-called very soft potentials. Let's say that when gamma is different from three, it's not so obvious to understand what is the physical meaning of the, of the equation, but at least there is an asymptotics which start from the, from the Boltzmann equation, which enables to reach after some scaling uh, those extended Landau operators. So let me describe it very quickly. Uh, if you define the, the Boltzmann kernel, uh, the Boltzmann uh, operator as uh, the quadratic operator in which you have this double integral, one on R3 and one on the sphere S2, of uh, the product of F after, uh, for the first partner after a collision and F for the second partner after a collision minus F of V times F of W, which are the velocities of the two partners before the collision. And you multiply all of this quantity by uh, V minus W to the gamma. So the modulus of V minus W to the gamma. And also by something which has some uh, dependence with respect to the angle between uh, the relative velocity and uh, this angle sigma, which appears in the integration. So if you write the Boltzmann equation, uh, the Boltzmann operator like that, then you will recover the Lando operator previously previously described by letting the angular dependence on the cross section, that is the function which is called here B epsilon, uh, by letting it con concentrate around the point zero. And uh, more precisely, in order to get the, the Lando operator, you have to take B epsilon like one over epsilon to the three times B of the parameter divided by epsilon after extension by zero. So uh, it's quite easy to, to show that if f is some smooth function and you let epsilon go to zero in, the, in this expression, you will end up with the Lando uh, operator. And more precisely, you will end up with the Lando operator with this uh, parameter gamma that was uh, described in the previous slide, exactly corresponding to the parameter gamma that you have in the Boltzmann equation. Now in the Boltzmann equation for gamma between uh, zero and one, we speak of hard potentials and for gamma strictly less than zero, we speak of soft potentials. And this explains the vocabulary, which is also used for the Landau equation, which is in some sense copied from the vocabulary of the Boltzmann equation. So I will not speak about the Boltzmann equation again in this talk. This is just to uh, show you uh, why uh, the original uh, operator of Landau was extended uh, in the various cases which, uh, which uh, were described in the, in the previous slide. Now, once you have the operator uh, of Landau, uh, you can write the Landau equation. And uh, if you suppose that the plasma is spatially homogeneous, you will just write df over dt is equal to q of ff. 
and Q will describe the binary collisions between the electrons in the, in the plasma. If the plasma is especially hom inhomogeneous, then you, you have to add the X variable and you will write down the equation DF over DT plus V gradient XF equal Q of FF. But of course, this is uh, uh, an oversimplification of the reality because the charged particles will create a field and this field will act on the charged particles. And so in principle, you should couple uh, this equation with uh, at least uh, Poisson's equation and most very often to, in fact, Maxwell equation for the field. So the real equation which is used in the computations, for example, of the of the Tokay Max is rather the uh, Vlasov-Maxwell-Lando equation. That is Vlasov-Maxwell plus the collisions uh, which uh, are described by the Lando operator. Okay. Now let me uh, let me present let's say a different uh, a different uh, presentation of the of the of the Lando uh, operator. Uh, it's clear it's clear from the beginning that the Lando operator is a parabolic second order operator in the velocity variable. Um, and one way to write it uh, uh, is, uh, is to give a name to the derivatives of the matrix A. I remember that A is the multiplication of the projection operator by some scalar function of the modulus uh, of Z. So when you take the first derivative, you take the, the, the divergence, let's say you end up with a, with a vector which is like this uh, minus two uh, z divided by modulus of z to the square times c, and then you can take a second derivative, and you end up with this complicated formula in which you have both c and c prime which are appearing. Um, now, when you do that, you can write this uh, sort of uh, uh, compact form of the operator. So there is the, the conservative formulation, which is very close to the original formula that I wrote in the first slide, in which you have the divergence of one term, which is uh, the product of gradient F by the matrix uh, A convoluted with F, and the second term, which is uh, the, uh, the vector B convoluted with F multiplied by F. This is the so-called conservative formulation. And actually, if you let uh, the divergent act on B uh, convoluted with F times F, you can also write it in the non-conservative form in which you have this uh, uh, convolution of A and F in front of the second derivative of F, and then you have a zero order term. Uh, if you write it in this way, then you can see that it's very close to uh, standard non-linear uh, uh, non uh, parabolic operators. The, here, what is not really standard is that you have these convolutions which, uh, which are acting, whereas in standard non-linear uh, diffusion operators, you would have some power of F and not A convoluted with F. It's uh, particularly interesting to, to do those computations when you start from the Coulomb interaction, which is a physical case, because in this case, you have a specially simple formula for B. This is just minus two times Z divided by Z to the square. And you have an, either, an even simpler formula for C because uh, you end up exactly with a constant which is minus eight pi times delta zero. So uh, when you are in the specific case uh, of the Coulomb interaction, of the physical interaction, the conservative formulation is still uh, quite complicated because A and B are, are still not completely trivial, but the non-conservative formulation is especially simple because as you can see, the zero order term is nothing but a constant times f to the square. So you end up with an operator which looks a little like Laplacian f plus f square. Now you know that 
in the wall space, if you look at the at the nonlinear uh, heat equation, DTF equal to Laplacian F plus F square, you may have blow ups. And it's uh, as we will see, it's uh, an important question to know whether or not those blow ups still appear in this modified version of the nonlinear heat equation in which you have in front of the second order derivatives, this quantity in which you have the convolution of F with something instead of just the Laplacian of F. But I will say more about this in the sequel. So um, it's, uh, it's quite useful to have uh, a weak formulation of the, of the operator. And this is obtained by, uh, as usual, by uh, multiplying the, the operator by a smooth function. So let's say a function which is in C2 and which has a compact support. And then uh, you integrate on the world space R3. And there are, let's say, uh, two presentations of the, of the weak formulation, which are both useful. So in the first one, remember that you had a gradient uh, you had a, sorry, a, um, a divergence in front of the integral. So if you multiply by phi and you integrate, this divergence will become a gradient of phi at point V. And so uh, actually you end up with the, with the formula, which is written in the first part of the slide and in which actually there is a constant, which is false uh, by just, um, making the change of variables v give w that is you symmetrize basically the the equation in fact you should have a one half in front uh, there is however another presentation in which you you take not only one derivative you, you do not do only one integration by parts in the in the weak formulation but actually you do two of them and so you will end up with the second derivative of phi somewhere in the in the integral, and this is what appears in the second line of uh, this slide. That is, you have one part in which you have the matrix A, which appears, and the second derivative of phi, and the second part in which you have B and the first derivative of phi. Uh, the second version is sometimes called very weak because you have done two integration by parts. And it's the best one if you want to define solutions which are as weak as possible. Whereas the first one is more useful in order to understand the conservations associated to the equation. So coming to this, let's look at the first, at the first identity. As you can see inside, you have this gradient phi of V minus gradient phi of W. If you take for phi uh, uh, the function one, then it's clear that this is zero because the gradient will be zero. And now if you take any component of V, so let's say VI, uh, it, uh, uh, it will also give you zero because you will have a vector which is fixed for gradient phi of V and the same for gradient phi of W and it will be the same. So it's clear that you have both conservation of mass and of momentum, which corresponds to multiplying by phi equal one or one of the components of V. Also, if you now you take the kinetic energy, that would be uh, once the mass is uh, normalized, it would be just the modulus of V to the square divided by two and you look at gradient phi of V, you see that you end up with V. And for gradient phi of W, of course, you will get W. So gradient phi of V minus gradient phi of W becomes V minus W. And then you have to remember that A is a projection onto the orthogonal of V minus W. Therefore, it still gives you zero. And uh, this is, uh, a feature of the land operator, which is quite important, that there is explicitly the conservation of mass, momentum, and kinetic energy for this operator. And actually, it is, of course, something that uh, Lando uh, was sort of uh, 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 putting into the machinery when he tried to get the operator. So it's not a surprise that it's still here at the end. 
Okay, now the more important uh, thing for the structure, for the mathematical structure of the operator is that you have, uh, since this uh, Lando operator can be obtained as a limit of uh, Boltzmann type operators, you can expect that there is an entropy uh, structure. This uh, entropy structure is uh, very reminiscent of the Boltzmann one. It consists in uh, multiplying the operator by the logarithm of f and by integrating. So if you remember the previous slide, in the first weak formulation, you had this gradient phi of v minus gradient phi of w. So now you take for phi the logarithm of f. So it will give you gradient f of v over f of v minus gradient f of w divided by f over w. And so you can rewrite the, uh, the uh, so-called entropy dissipation, which is this quantity in which you have minus the integral of q times log f uh, as this one half of the integral of f of v, f of w, the matrix psi times pi, and then the vector gradient f of f over f of v minus gradient f over f of w which acts both on the right-hand side and on the left-hand side of the matrix. Now, this matrix is uh, semi-definite positive because it's a projection operator. And so this quantity is non-negative. And this is the Landau version of the first part of Boltzmann's H theorem. So it was remained of Boltzmann's H theorem, at least the first part, when you look at the Landau equation or the Landau operator. Uh, now, if you if you take a solution uh, f of t and v of the Landau equation of the spatially homogeneous Landau equation, then uh, you can see that formally the derivative of the entropy, which is just the integral of f log f, will be non-positive, so that you have a decay of the entropy along the solutions of the Landau equation. Of course, here the entropy is minus the entropy of the physicist. And so, of course, you would have an entropy which increases if you take minus integral of f log f. So this is the entropy structure for the Landau equation. And this has a natural consequence when you're looking at a priori estimates for the spatially homogeneous Landau equation. So uh, you know that mass and energy are conserved. Uh, because it's conserved at the level of the operator. And so you have that the integral of f times 1 plus v square over 2 is conserved along the solutions of the, of the spatially homogeneous Landau equation. So in the, in the formula in the slide, you have the first part, which is just a conserved quantity. And then you know that the integral of f log f is decreasing. And actually, it's a decay. Uh, when you look between time zero and capital T will be exactly the integral between zero and T of the entropy dissipation, which I call D. So this quantity D is uh, non-negative. And so you can put it in the right-hand side of the estimate and you end up with what is written on the slide. Once you have transformed the logarithm of F in the absolute value of the logarithm of F, which you can do by a little trick that I will not uh, indicate here. So all in all, what the physics tells you about the spatially homogeneous uh, Landau equation is that the natural entropy, the natural, sorry, uh, a priori estimate is that if the initial mass, energy, and entropy are finite, then they will remain finite forever. And moreover, the integral in time of the entropy dissipation should be bounded. This is this uh, quantity integral from 0 to t of t. OK, so this is a natural entropy. This is natural a priori estimate. Now, in order to understand the difficulties which are related to the, to the Landau equation, one has to look a little um, to the behavior of the matrix A when uh, v is close to w. 
uh, it's clear that if psi is like uh, z to the gamma plus two, then aig, which is the multiplication of this function by the projection operator, which is not singular, will have the same singularity and you will end up with something which behaves like v minus w to the gamma plus two when v is close to w. And when you put this uh, estimation inside the weak formulation of the Landau equation, you see that if you have supposed that phi is a good smooth function, the quantity uh, dij phi of v plus dij phi of w will be something smooth. And you will end up with a singularity which looks like the integral <laughs> over r3 times r3 of f of v times f of w times this modulus of v minus w to the gamma plus two. And remember that you are in dimension three. So it's clear that uh, if you only know that f is in L1 in the v variable, this quantity will be finite only if you suppose that gamma plus two is bigger than zero. And this is exactly what happens when you have hard potentials, Maxwell molecules, or moderately soft potentials. So you will have in that case, weak solutions, which are well-defined under the a priori estimates, which are given by the physics. That is the fact that one plus V square times F is in L infinity in time value in L1 in V. Uh, N is equal to three here. Um, but you see also that if you are in the case of uh, uh, bad soft potentials, I mean, uh, uh, for example, if you are in the physical case when gamma is equal to minus three, then to know that F is in L1 in V will basically not be enough to give a sense to this quantity uh, which appears in the weak formulation. So you can immediately see that there, there is one difficulty for defining weak solutions if you are in the physical case uh, of the Coulomb interaction. This is the reason why the, the mathematical theory uh, was developed first for the easier cases of hard potential Maxwell molecules or moderately soft potentials. And uh, I will not say too much about, about this, but let's say that in the last 20 years, there, had, there have been a lot of papers of cases. And in some sense, uh, the theory is now well understood. There are weak solutions. And in fact, in all those cases, those solutions are strong under reasonable hypothesis. So in some sense, if you are in any one of those cases, you have a good, especially homogeneous equation for the Landau operator. But as you can see, this does not include the Coulomb case, which is the most interesting and maybe the only interesting. Uh, let me add that uh, there is also uh, a, a good theory for especially inhomogeneous uh, solutions of the of the Landau equation in those uh, in those cases, uh, which do not include the the Coulomb uh, potential, and uh, it can be done either locally in time, so um, uh, for large data, or for all times, but with data which are initially close to a Maxwellian. So you can find results in the papers which are cited on the slide. When you are looking at the, at the, at, at the physical case in which you have the, the, the Coulomb potential, uh, next idea consists in trying to use the entropy dissipation. Because in all that I described previously, basically you were using just the conservation of mass and energy and, entropy, and the decay of entropy. But now, if you want to use the entropy dissipation, somehow um, there are two uh, directions which can be taken. And actually the first one uh, led to the concept of H solutions by Villani in 98 and to renormalize the uh, uh, solution with defect measure 
uh, which can be summarized in the paper by Alexandre and Villani, but which were already proposed in the in a former paper by Pierre Louis Lyons. Uh, in all those papers, the idea is to look at the weak formulation of the equation, at some weak formulation of the equation, and to try to make appear inside this weak formulation the quantity d, which you know is bounded in L1 in time. So H solutions are really based on, 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 on this idea. And renormalized solution is a little more complicated, but it is still based on this. And so this is the first way of using uh, the entropy dissipation. This is what I call the direct use of the entropy dissipation. However, you end up with concepts of solution which are extremely weak when you do that. And so the next step consisted in um, trying to use uh, uh, a strategy which was uh, successful for the Boltzmann equation without angular cutoff. So some kind of very singular Boltzmann equations, which naturally appear uh, when you look at the, at the physics of the Boltzmann equation. Uh, and I said previously that I would not uh, speak again about the Boltzmann equation, but uh, actually it was a lie. Uh, so here is the entropy dissipation associated to the Boltzmann operator. And so the case of uh, without angular cutoff consists in supposing that the angular dependence of the cross section, that is a small b here, is actually singular in the sense that it's like theta to the minus one minus alpha with alpha strictly positive. So in some sense, you take a small b, which is not in L1, and when you do this, it's possible to show that the entropy dissipation of Boltzmann somehow controls um, some Sobolev, some uh, fractional Sobolev norm of the square root of f to the square. If you look at a ball, at a given ball, uh, this is the this is the estimate which is written at the at the end of the slide. And uh, the constant which is in front depends on quantities which are controlled when you look at the specially homogeneous solution of the Boltzmann equation. So as you can see, the strategy here is to use this entropy dissipation, which you know will be bounded in L1 in time, to bound it from below by some quantity which controls the smoothness of f. So here you have some Sobolev regularity for the square root of f. And so the, uh, this idea was implemented in a paper that I wrote a few years ago and which can be uh, summarized by the following estimate. That now you look at the entropy dissipation of the Landau equation for the Coulomb interaction. So you look at the real physical model. And then what you can say is that this entropy dissipation, the quantity which is called d here, uh, you add a constant, let's say, this will be bigger than actually the weighted Fisher information for f, that is the gradient of the square root of f to the square multiplied by some weight. And the, the constant C, which appears in the, in the inequality, is something which depends on quantities which you know are uh, controlled in the evolution of the specially homogeneous solutions for the Landau equation with Coulomb interaction. That is the mass, momentum, energy, and entropy. So, uh, the, let me add one word about the fact that it's really possible to uh, somehow uh, measure the constant C in a reasonable situation. And as you can see, you obtain numbers which are human. That is, you have a 100, a 13 to the three half, et cetera, et cetera. Well, when you multiply everything, you see that you are still close to 10 millions, actually. Uh, but uh, somehow it's possible in simple cases to check that in this inequality, it's possible to compute explicitly the constant C. So how is it possible to use this estimate? But now you know that uh, 
the integral from zero to capital T of the quantity D is bounded. You know that D is bounded in L1 in time. And so since D is basically bigger than the Fisher information for F up to a weight, you obtain the uh, estimate that is written at the end of the slide that the uh, integral in time and V of this quantity is finite. So this is still put at the beginning of this slide. Then you do a Sobolev embedding. You know that the square root of F will basically be in L6 because its gradient is uh, in L2 and you are in dimension three. And uh, this is the square root of F. So for F, it gives you an L3 uh, estimate. And as you can see, you end up with an estimate which looks like L1 in time, L3 in V up to weight. And for when you know that, then it is enough to define quantities like the integral in time and in V and V star of F of V, F of V star, modulus of V minus V star to the minus one. And this was the quantity which had to be uh, shown to exist in order to get weak solutions, because this is what was appearing in the weak formulation of the equation. Uh, and so uh, I will come back to the previous slide to now comment the, the proposition that can be obtained thanks to that. Uh, in some sense, it tells you that any reasonable H solution, which was obtained by Villani in 98 for the spatially homogeneous uh, equation of Landau with Coulomb potential is in fact a standard weak solution because you have this extra estimate that gradient, that sorry, uh, square root of F is in L2 with value which H1. So that F is in fact in, is in L1 with value in L3. Okay, so I hope that I convinced you that thanks to the study of the entropy dissipation and to allow a bound of the entropy dissipation, uh, you get an extra estimate for, for the solution of the, of the Landau equation. And thanks to this, you're able to give a sense to the, to the standard weak formulation. So this was done about five years ago. And now I would like to present a certain number of results which were uh, uh, deduced from, from this estimate. So the first one is a study by uh, uh, Maria Pia Gualdani, uh, François Gols, uh, um, Cyril Lambert, and Alexis Vasseur, and this was done uh, two years ago. So actually, they were able to show that if you start from a reasonable initial datum uh, for the spatially homogeneous Landau equation with Coulomb potential, then you can control the, the, the Hausdorff dimension of the set of times at which the solution is singular. So somehow you can show that most of the time the solution is smooth and maybe some, for some times uh, the solution is singular. This is a result which is uh, known for the 3D incompressible Navier-Stokes equation and the method of proof of course is reminiscent of that but there are many extra uh, arguments in order to in order to get this result. It's also possible to look at the large time behavior of the of the Landau equation with Coulomb potential, and um, we know from the analysis of the of the from, from the spectral analysis of the linearized equation that there is no spectral gap, and we do not expect uh, exponential convergence towards the uh, equilibrium, but rather a so-called stretch exponential rate, which is exponential of some power of time, which is uh, between zero and one. And actually together with uh, 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 Kleber Carapatoso and Nim Bing He, uh, we were able to prove a few years ago that uh, by a direct use of, the, of this uh, entropy estimate, uh, this decay indeed uh, uh, happens, provided that you start from an initial datum which has a lot of moments, which, would de which decays quite quickly 
at infinity when v goes to infinity. Uh, actually, the decay is not uh, is not optimal, and we do not get the same decay as uh, um, uh, predicted by the linearized theory. But this was corrected later by uh, Kleber Carapatoso and Stefan Michler. And uh, now there is a whole theory of the, of the large time behavior of the, of the equation, which is uh, quite optimal. So those are two, uh, let's say, byproducts of this uh, entropy dissipation inequality. And actually, there is, uh, there is uh, the most recent one is a, a result that uh, I obtained together with uh, Ling Binghe and uh, Ji Cheng Jiang. And uh, uh, this is a result which is um, very reminiscent of uh, the result of Leray uh, on the Navier-Stokes, on the 3D incompressible Navier-Stokes equation. So the result by Leray tells you basically that if you multiply the L2 norm of uh, U by the L2 norm of gradient U, uh, where U is the initial datum for the Navier-Stokes equation, so if this quantity is small enough, then you will have smooth solution of the Navier-Stokes equation. This is the result by Leray. And here we have a result which is very close in which basically the, 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 the L2 energy is replaced by the entropy and the H1 uh, norm of uh, gradient U is replaced by the H1 norm with some weight of uh, the solution F. And so it's, I think, quite interesting to see that we have now a situation for the spatially homogeneous Landau equation with Coulomb potential, which is extremely close to what is in, to, to, to the situation of the 3D compressible Navier-Stokes equation. So let me try to list the, the analogies. First, those equations uh, are 3D. They are second order in terms of derivatives and they are quadratic. So all of this is obvious and it shows that there is, uh, of course, uh, let's say, uh, 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 I mean, the mathematical theory will have some, uh, uh, some similarities just because of this. But actually it's possible to check that there is also some scaling invariance which uh, is reminiscent in the in the Landau equation to what is known in the Navier-Stokes equation. This is written in the paper by uh, uh, Gualdani, Gold, Samber, and Vasseur. And from the point of view of the kind of solution that we have, we are also very close in the sense that we have now uh, weak solutions which are obtained globally in time. We have Leray style solutions. We have uh, control on the set of times at which the solutions can become singular. And we still don't know whether or not there are exist strong solutions for any large initial data. So as you can see, we have a really a lot of similarities and it's not really clear whether or not uh, one of the equation is easier to solve than the other. Of course, it's known that for the Navier-Stokes equation, it's very difficult. And uh, well, for the Landau equation, we don't really know if it's as difficult or maybe, maybe easier. But anyway, we are exactly at the same place in terms of the mathematical results. So, uh, what I would like to present now is really something that I obtained um, a few months ago and uh, which answers the following question. Uh, all those results that we have now on this, uh, on this equation are based on this estimate that the Fisher information, so some weighted Fisher information is bounded by the entropy dissipation of the Landau equation with Coulomb interaction. But if you look at the proof of this estimate, you can see that you never use inside the singularity uh, of the potential. That is, you do not use the fact that one over Z is 
uh, infinite when z is close to zero. And so exactly the same proof would hold if you would cut the singularity at some place and replace z to the minus one by the maximum of one and z to the minus one. And so because of this, uh, one uh, immediately uh, uh, wonders if it's not possible to improve actually this estimate. Uh, and improving it typically using the singularity that you have in the, in the, when z is close to zero. So I tried to answer this question and uh, I ended up with the following uh, remarks. Uh, first, uh, the, the known estimate tells you that up to the constant one, the additive constant one, the entropy dissipation is bigger than this feature information with a weight. And you have a constant C of F in front, which depends on uh, things that basically you, you hope to control. Now, if you try to, to get an estimate from above instead of from below, you look at, uh, at the, this quantity D of F. And what the first thing that you can say is that if you are trying to, to get an estimate from above, you can remove the projection pi of V minus W and replace it by the identity matrix. And then you would get just the square of gradient F over F of V minus gradient F over F of W. Now you expand this and you observe that basically you can, everything is, uh, is uh, symmetric with respect to V gives W. And so, what, what uh, uh, you end up with just the gradient f over f to the square at point v times f of v times f of v star times the modulus of v minus uh, w to the two plus gamma. Well, uh, up to a small manipulation, you see that basically this will give you a weight which is one plus v square to the one plus gamma over two. So somehow the difference between the lower bound and the upper bound resides basically in this weight. So the amount of uh, uh, the amount of non-optimality in the in the estimate really resides in the weight and nothing else. So that is already not very good not a very good news. <laughs> but actually, it's possible to go beyond this naive estimate. And to work uh, seriously on the on the on the formulas, and then you end up with the following. So I will spend a few minutes uh, uh, trying to explain this. Actually, if you look at the lower bound, uh, the one which corresponds to the, the result of 2014, it's possible to show that you can replace gradient f over f to the square by a quantity which is a little more complicated. So you add to this the cross product of V and gradient F over F to the square. So uh, it needs a, a little more care in the, in the estimates in order to get this term, but it's not very difficult. So I would say it's more like you, instead of doing things uh, quickly, you, you do it uh, quietly when you do the estimates and you see that this, this thing naturally shows up. And from the point of view of the above estimate, you can do exactly the same and you end up with exactly the same term. And then the weight that you have in the one plus V square will be exactly the same as in the lower bound. So in this version of the estimate, which is which I call now quasi-optimal, you have the same weight. And so in some sense, D of F is really squeezed between uh, a constant which I call the C minus and a constant which I call C plus times this quantity. So in some sense, D of F really controls exactly this quantity. That is the weighted Fisher information and this variant in which you have this cross product of the Fisher information. 
If you look at what uh, is inside C minus of F and C plus of F, you see that it depends on some moments of F and some LP norms of F. But actually, whether gamma, I mean, in the case when gamma is equal to zero, it depends on the LP norm for the minus and on the moment for the C plus. And it's a reverse if gamma is less than zero. So it's not it's not exactly squeezed with the same the same constant, but it's very close. And it's the reason why I call it quasi optimal. Also, there is a one plus in front of the of the of the quantities in the first one, which does not appear in the second one in this formulation. And uh, yes, there are variants in which you can eliminate this one, let's say. So uh, let me say that this uh, new estimate was used uh, in order to, to provide a gradient flow structure for the Landau equation. And this was done in, in work with uh, uh, Jose Carrillo, uh, Matthias uh, Delgadino, and Jeremy Wu. But unfortunately, we are not able to do it for the Coulomb potential, and we, we know how to do it only for moderately soft potentials. So we are not yet uh, at the point in which this gradient flow structure is really effective for the physical equation. Uh, I see that uh, it will be difficult to give you an idea of the proof. Uh, I will still say a few words. Uh, let's say that uh, the whole proof is based on the, on the following idea, that the entropy dissipation is uh, is uh, uh, obtained when you apply the projection operator on gradient f over f of v minus gradient f over f of w as a quadratic form. And so uh, an alternative way of doing that is to forget about the projection operator and to look at the cross product between v minus w and gradient f over f of v minus gradient f over f of w. So this is what I call q here. And qij is just the ij component of this cross product. And then the, the main idea consists in writing this cross product, uh, actually to expand it as functions of v, functions of w, and mixed functions of v and w. So when you do that, you naturally make appear the cross product between V and gradient F over F. And it's the reason why this quantity will appear in both the uh, upper and lower bounds for the entropy dissipation. So I will not say more about this. Uh, and I would like rather maybe to, to go directly to some comments and some perspectives. Uh, so let me start by the last comment, actually. Um, if you remember, I said that there was some hope that we could improve the entropy dissipation estimate in order to get uh, something better than the, than the weighted Fisher information for F, which would provide some extra uh, knowledge about the smoothness of the solutions of the of the Landau equation and may and if we are very optimistic uh, this would help to show that there is no blow up of, uh, of those solutions actually the this work on trying to get optimal um, optimal uh, bounds shows exactly the the opposite that is in fact we have formulations which are almost optimal and the best we can hope for is to gain little on the weights, that is on the behavior when V goes to infinity and not on the singularities. So somehow this, these quasi-optimal uh, estimates that give you a negative result. They tell you that you have extracted from the entropy dissipation all that could be extracted. And uh, you cannot get better than the sentence that is written on the slide that is some weighted Fisher information is bounded in L1 in time. And so this tells you that if you want to show that there is no blow up 
for the Lando equation with uh, Coulomb interaction, then it's not enough. It's not sufficient to look at the entropy dissipation, and you have to come up to 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 invent something new. Uh, maybe some other uh, quantity uh, which decays or which is controlled in some way. But it's not possible to just focus on the entropy dissipation and hope to get out of it something else. So that is bad news. One has to look to some other quantity now. Uh, well, on, on the side of positive results, I would like to, to make the publicity about two um two results uh which uh, appeared uh, very uh, recently the first one is uh, a work that i did uh, together with uh, maxim breden and uh, it's uh, some um, some attempt to to get the same kind of uh, estimates for the operators coming out of weak turbulence uh basically operators like the one that uh, Yanni showed uh, uh, yesterday. And uh, let's say what we, what we have been able to do in a, in a rigorous way up to now is just the case of equality, which corresponds to the second part of Boltzmann's H theorem for a large class of such operators. Uh, so we are still far from estimates. We know the case of equality, basically. Uh, the second uh, paper I would like to uh, um, to discuss a little is this extension uh, to Lando Fermi Dirac models, which was uh, proposed by uh, Ricardo Alonso, Veronique Baglan, Bertrand Lotz, and myself. Um, the idea there is to look at a different model in which you have some quantum effect. So you have uh, some uh, uh, exclusion principle, uh, which uh, somehow um, uh, makes the, the density uh, bounded. And uh, then it's possible to try to do the same kind of estimates. And so we did that. And uh, the, the goal here is to have something which is uniform with respect to the height at which you put the exclusion principle. So somehow we provided uh, estimates which when uh, some quantum parameter goes to zero, give you back the original, the estimate on the classical Lando equation. Well, I think I will, uh, I will stop now. <laughs> Right. So thank you very much, Laurent, for uh, this uh, very clear talk. Uh, is there any question? Yes. Uh, so concerning uh, um, the result uh, that you obtained together with uh, Ying Bing and uh, Tian mm -hmm. about this perturbative strong solution. So this is done in the homogeneous case. Mm -hmm. Then my question is, can you do something for the inhomogeneous uh, in the same spirit of Yang Wu, but avoiding all these techniques? Uh, so actually, um, I, I think that there is a paper which was written uh, more recently by the group of, um, if I'm not mistaken, it should be Michler, uh, Carapatoso, and maybe Tristani also. Uh, in which they sort of revisit the, the theory of Yan Wu and they provide, I think, of estimates which are uh, sharper and also easier to get. So in some sense, this has already been done, but it's in a spirit which is quite different from the Leray style solution. That is, Leray style solution is really, I think, uh, something which is specific of the homogeneous case and which has no real translation in the in homogeneous case. I don't know if I, this answers you. Yes, yes. Thank you. Is there any question online? No? Okay, so actually I would have two questions. So the first one um, corresponding to the, the article, I mean the result that Chiara already uh, 
question about. So the one that you obtained in 2017 with the uh, Limbing and Feder Card that also. Uh, so you said that there is no spectral gap. So you do not expect an exponential convergence towards the equilibrium, right? Yeah, yeah. So you, and, and, okay. and, and so you said that uh, there is kind of extended uh, exponential convergence. Or you didn't say extend. What do you mean by uh, by this convergence? Sorry, I did not. I did not catch the the, the, the uh, end of your sentence. Yes, so, so you wrote. Um, I wrote stretched exponential. Stretched uh, exponential convergence. So what, what do you mean by this? This just means uh, exponential of uh, minus t to some power between, which is between 0 and 1. So it's between polynomial and uh, exponential, let's say. OK, OK, thank you. And also, so corresponding to the um, control of the entropy dissipation and the weighted feature information you had, so if I'm correct, the explicit uh, constants you obtain is in the radial case? Yes, exactly, exactly. It's, it's a case in which you can really compute most of the, of the constants. Yeah. Okay, and so my question is the following. So it, it reminds a bit, you know, the original paper of Karl Mann about the Cauchy problem for the Boltzmann equation. Mm -hmm. Is there um, easy results about the Cauchy problem concerning the Landau equation in the homogeneous radial case? Actually, some people have been trying to do that because, in, of course, it's... Uh, it's appealing, I mean, to, to try to do a, a simpler case, which looks like simpler. <laughs> but actually, uh, then there are a lot of problems with the singularity at point zero, as, as one can imagine in, 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 in a radially symmetric situation. And so, for example, I think that uh, Maria Pia Gualdani was, uh, has been thinking about this, and, but I don't think that um, it really helps, in fact. So maybe, Maybe it's because we have not yet found the right way to, to do it, but uh, it's, it's, it's not really helpful to look at radially symmetric solutions, I think, uh, or it has not been possible to exploit this. And uh, this is all the more uh, disappointing that in the radially symmetric case, there, there are actually very nice formulas which, uh, which can be obtained and uh, especially in the Coulomb case. I mean, it's really possible to, to do very nice things, but it doesn't seem that it really helps. Cannot say more, unfortunately. But sorry, Laurent, is it trivial to, if you start from a radially symmetric data to prove that then it's radially symmetric at later time? Because you have these, uh, I mean, there are some directions in which you have no diffusion, so, right? No, it's, it's not completely trivial. My, uh, my, my answer would be the following that, uh, the, the best way to understand it is actually to, to look at it at the level of the Boltzmann equation, which we, in which you can really check it easily because you don't have any derivatives inside the, uh, inside the, the operator. And then the Landau equation is a limit of the, of the Boltzmann operator. So you can, you can really get it as a freely, I mean, from, uh, but if you, if you try to do it on the Landau directly, it's not that easy. I mean, the computations are, are really not so, not so easy to do. But in the end, my time, did the radius symmetric case, but like removing the projection. So she had to remove the fact that the radius is taken to the projection. So she had to remove the fact that you have some directions in which uh, the projection acts on something and gives you zero. So. <laughs> So it seems that the, the fact that you have this uh, somehow anisotropy built in in the equation uh, doesn't make the symmetric case uh, much more simple. Yeah, it's yeah, sure. It's um, I, I cannot say much more about this except that I tried a lot to use the radial symmetry. And I wasn't able to, to get out of it anything. So we, we spent a lot of time together with Francois Gols to, to do something. And... Okay, thank you very much. Is there any other question? No? Okay, so thank you again, Laurent. Thanks a lot.